Good morning. Are you on? Good morning, everyone. How's your bank holiday? Hope you're enjoying it. Oh, well, if you're watching this, maybe you're going to enjoy it after this. Hope you're enjoying it watching this. Um, the sun is not shining at the coast, so if you're thinking of coming to the coast, head inland. Um, it is pretty misty down here this morning. Well, it's great to have you with us, and um, I'm going to rattle through. Uh, do you know when you spend a couple of weeks preparing to preach, which is generally what I do, um, because you have to not just understand and know the Scripture and the context and all of that stuff, but you have to look and listen for the um, spontaneous flow of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And, and it's from that that you bring the Word. And um, so sometimes you, you prepare for two weeks and then you get up this morning and God begins to give you another download of something else that you have to bring. And you think, what a waste of time, God. Uh, two weeks ago, you could have done that. Um, but actually, the two weeks, I believe, really does help in the spontaneous flow of this morning. I think it all adds, to be honest with you, even if we don't get to preach it, I think it all adds. And actually what's most important is that you get a spontaneous flow of what God's saying this morning, and um, I hope that my spontaneous flow helps you do that, because without you hearing directly from heaven, it's my word that you're listening to. And my hope is it inspires you, and Holy Spirit gets hold of you this morning, and you hear something of Him. Um, so one of the things I wasn't going to start with is this, um, and it's a testimony that somebody sent me just this week when I was preparing to speak about your inheritance and receiving your inheritance from Joshua's point of view. I'll ne leave the names out, but it says this, um, you prayed for me in 2011 with reference to breakthrough for my inheritance. Within days, the inheritance came through. I believe, Alan, that you have authority in the heavenly realms to declare breakthrough for wealth. Wealth in the northeast from hidden treasures in dark places that abundant prosperity will come to the northeast. We will call out the wealth of the wicked into the storehouses of the righteous. So isn't it, isn't it weird that you begin a preach or begin preparing a preach on inheritance and you get a testimony from 2011? Why that was sent last week? Probably because I was preparing for a preach on inheritance. So as I talk through this today, and I'm going to be really brief today because I'm aware it is bank holiday. <laughs> so I'm going to be brief today, but as I talk through this, Receive that spontaneous flow and receive what heaven is releasing, whether heaven is releasing that through me or through you sitting in your house or through someone sitting with you or through something else you've heard, but heaven is releasing inheritance. It's a, it's a continuation. It's not, you have it, you have it all. <laughs> it's, it's an awareness of what you have. And we can become even more aware. So I want to start off with a verse from Hebrews. Again, this wasn't in my preach, but here you go. It's what God spoke to me this morning about. It's a really good verse that you all have on your fridge doors and probably on the back of your cars as a sticker. It's from Hebrews 6 and verse 12. And it says this, do not become lazy. Yeah, that's what it says. Do not become lazy, but... To imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Do not become lazy, but through faith and patience imitate those who have received what has been promised. So there's a pattern that we can follow as Joshua did. And I've entitled this little preach, um, Put Feet on Your Faith. Put Feet on Your Faith. And it's interesting because people think they receive their inheritance and they don't have to do anything. Oh, I've got my inheritance. That's not how it works. <laughs> you may have it, but to benefit from it, you need to put feet to your faith. There is a working out, as you'll see with Joshua. So claiming your inheritance. Um, I don't know if you remember, you probably won't remember, and that's no, I'm not bringing any condemnation, um, but my last preach, 
I actually preached on, uh, about a month ago, preached on Philippians 2.13, and it says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act, to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. So it's, it's, it's both. It's both hearing the Word of the Lord and then acting upon the Word of the Lord. Um, I've got a picture I want to put up. Um, I, I'm looking behind me, but I'm not going to be able to see it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm looking behind me. That's the old school. Um, somebody will have to wave to me when it's up online. It's up online. Um, anybody recognize what that is? Anybody in the house here? Because obviously they're not going to recognize, re- reply to me at home. Posh dinner? What, well, it is a dessert. What kind? What do you think that is? It is. It is a deconstructed Black Forest Gatto. That's what that is. So if you can put the other picture up of the Black Forest Gatto, which is a constructed Black Forest Gatto. Why am I showing you that? You can take the Black Forest Gatto off because everybody will be drooling um, over Black Forest Gatto when I'm preaching. Um, it's interesting that here Joshua and, and the whole children of Israel have been in the desert for 40 years. They were shown a promised land 40 years ago. They missed it. And they ended up in a desert for 40 years. And here God is saying to Joshua, you're going to take these people into their inheritance. You're going to move from this place to another place. If you like, he was deconstructing the last 40 years and what that looked like because they lived in a desert. God provided their food. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. God provided water. So they were moving from a place of desert experience, even though they were seeing the hand of God on a daily basis, into a promised land, into their inheritance. So God was deconstructing, hear me on this, follow me, God was deconstructing how they did church or life. And it was no longer going to look like it looked. It was going to look like something different. Now, isn't that a word right now for us as we think about returning back to church after lockdown? Not just us, but many churches. I've actually had two ministers on to me, even last week, talking about this very thing. Let me just say this, that I believe there's a danger in deconstructing church without fully understanding what the new constructed church looks like. You see, Joshua moved from a place of desert into the promised land, but he knew what had been promised, and he knew where he was leading the people. There is a big danger in being a bit cheesed off with church and saying we don't want to go back to how it was without revelation and knowledge of what the new looks like. Because then it literally is the blind leading the blind. Joshua knew where he was going. Why? Because of his forefathers. (laughs) He was living out the promises of what was promised to his forefathers from Isaac and from Jacob, from Abraham. All of these promises went way back. He knew what he was doing. I think it is a time, hear me right, of deconstruction of church. But I also think it is a very dangerous place if we're not fully understanding what the next season holds and we don't understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. Joshua came to his inheritance way back from his forefathers. And can you imagine it? They moved from a place of slavery for hundreds of years into the desert place, and then Joshua gets a job of going, I'm going to take you into the promised land. (laughs) A promised land that, that for many would have seemed out of reach. So does that sound like inheritance to you? You know, they they went from that place of slavery and wandering in the desert, and then they went uh, to going to go across the Jordan and begin their journey, but it began with battles to take the land. So I'm back to how I started here. You see, inheritance isn't just a matter of going, I have my inheritance. They actually had to go into the land and begin to battle for what was theirs. Don't be lazy. 
we need to begin to battle for what is already ours. You think, well, why is it not flowing? Well, we've got a battle for it. It will flow, but there is a battle that's needed for your inheritance. It doesn't sound like inheritance, that, does it? But for me, it sounds like daily living. It sounds like putting feet to my faith. That's what it sounds like to me. Remember the sent spies over 38 years before this, and what was the word? Most of us know this verse, but what, what did they come back with? The 10 that didn't want to go in said this, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes compared to the giants. You see, how we see ourselves is vitally important to receiving our inheritance. If you think you're a no good, nobody who doesn't deserve anything, that's probably what you'll get. But if you believe that you're created in God's image, that you're a child of God, that when you stepped into Christ, you stepped into all the inheritance, all the fullness that Christ brought, suddenly you begin to attract something from heaven that is different than I'm a no good nobody. You are a somebody. You have an inheritance that Jesus died for, give his blood, shed his blood for, and therefore, don't be lazy in pursuing what cost God everything to give you. Don't be lazy about it. Don't beat yourself up. Don't see yourself as a grasshopper in the eyes of giants. We walk by faith, not by sight. You see, the, the ten who came back seen the giants. <laughs> Don't be imitated by the giants, but believe the promises of God over your life. And listen, we all know life throws giants at us. We all know that. But in the midst of seeing your giant, remember the promises of God. <laughs> giants are there to be overcome. And they will produce character in your life, I'm telling you. But they are overcomable. God has a way of overcoming giants when he has promised you something beyond what, they're, what you're seeing when you look at them. Children of Israel got delivered. They got saved from bondage. Yet they perceived themselves and the giants, and it cost, uh, they perceived themselves as grasshoppers, and it cost them 38 years of desert wandering because of how they perceived themselves. Later on, which I don't think I'll get into, when, when they eventually get across into Jordan and, and, and they meet the prostitute whose house they stayed at this time, another two spies went, uh, Rehab, and they were in her house, and she said, we heard of your testimony and we were terrified of you. You see, the people were terrified, but the spies were terrified of the people. <laughs> They missed their inheritance. By 38 years, they wandered around. And a whole generation died out. I'm going to skip through quite a bit of this. That their inheritance was the land. Their inheritance was the land. The land is mentioned 87 times in the book of Joshua. So do you think God might be saying something? God had made a covenant, not just with Joshua, but with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if they kept the law, he promised them the land. It was a promise. God cannot break a promise. He cannot do it. He cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. This was a land full of cows and bees, or a land flowing with milk and honey. But if you come from a desert, if you lived in a desert, and suddenly the land was full of cows and bees, what does that tell you about the land? tells you that the land could sustain you, that it has life in it. It tells you that it's more than living in a desert. <laughs> it tells you if cows can survive and bees can survive, it's not just about what they can produce, but what the land might look like. It gives you hope beyond your desert experience. So yeah, they would be excited, wouldn't it? But listen what it says in Joshua. It says, I will give you every place that your foot steps, as promised to Moses, as promised to your forefather. Every place your foot steps, put feet to your faith. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I, 
I'll go on quickly just to talk about this. I'm going to cut loads out because I do want to be quick today. But what does it mean? It means this, that, that there is a process in receiving the land. There is a process. And the process is, or the promise here was, wherever you set foot, you can have. It's yours. There'll be battles. There'll be work to do. But it is yours. Joshua was encouraged to be strong, wasn't he? Of course he was encouraged to be strong because he was following a great man of God who, who regularly went away for 40 days and 40, well, twice at least, went away for 40 days and 40 nights without food and without drink and was sustained by the presence of God who would go up a mountain and see God and come down and his face would be, would be so glowing that they couldn't even look at him. Such was the presence of God on his life. The many miracles that Moses did. And here's Joshua, who was known as his aid, Moses' aid, suddenly now has to lead these people. And you can hear in the words that God spoke directly to Joshua when he says, Joshua, be bold, be courageous. You can do this. Why? Because I've promised you that you'll win. I've promised you it. But you need to be bold. You need to set your foot on the land. You need to take what's rightfully yours. You need to stop seeing yourself as a grasshopper in the eyes of giants. You need to put faith to your, your feet to your faith and need to move into the promised land. Wherever your foot treads, I'll give you. You sit by the bank and you'll get an out other than the bank. That'll be it. The bank of the river. Leading a whole bunch of people. You can almost hear Joshua's knees knocking, can't you? <laughs> be strong, be courageous. What great words for God to speak over your life. Can you imagine hearing that from, just from a prophet, but hearing it from God? Moses, um, Joshua, be strong, be courageous. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Be strong, be courageous. God promises Joshua. Wow. You know, Joshua, I think was mentioned earlier on in the series, Joshua and Jesus, uh, the names um, translated can mean the same. Taken from the word Yeshua. Um, and, and, and people have often said Joshua is a type of Jesus only in the Old Testament. And in many ways, Joshua and Moses were living under the law, but Jesus came, Jesus came, not with law, but with grace. And we entered into a new covenant, not the old covenant of the law. The law was fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus came to bring you and me our inheritance. All that heaven has, every spiritual gift in the heavenly places is yours. Because God made it so. He promised it. But how many of those will you walk in? Well, whatever your foot tread. Whatever you want to step, whatever it is that you, that you go after, that you're, you're attracted to, becomes attracted to you. It's not a matter of sitting and waiting. It's a matter of walking and believing. Anyone can have a promise. Anyone can have a promise. Anyone can have a word of prophecy over their lives. But we have to walk it out. We have to walk it out. You know, Joshua, the reckoning in the desert, there was about 1.2 million people died in that 38 years. A whole generation died out. Somebody said that that was probably about 85 people per day died in the desert. Because a whole generation had to go, apart from two people, they were the two spies who didn't see themselves as grasshoppers, Joshua and Caleb. But you know, there's not many, not many people, I'm saying you know this, but I don't think many people know this. <laughs> Joshua was promised, and if you look at what Joshua was promised, it was promised the land from Lebanon to the Great River, which is Iraq, and then he was promised to the Great Sea, which was the Mediterranean. And, and I, I, I haven't done this, by the way, but if you look at the map and you look at the area that he was promised, it was a vast and a huge area. But if you look at actually the land he took, 
it was only 10% of what was promised. This great man of God, Joshua. And he only took 10% of what was promised. You know, we, we don't, you know, he didn't go and occupy Iraq. Um, and, and we never hear of it in, in Syria or Lebanon. Why? Simple. It's very simple. The promise of God was this. Wherever you set your foot, I'll give you. They didn't set their foot there. But if they had of, they could have took it. Because it was promised. It was in their inheritance. I'll give you the land that your foot steps. Our inheritance is already ours. It's a gift. God has already won it. But we need to participate in the receiving or understanding or the live it out, excuse me, of that full gift. There is a sense, I believe, I don't know about you, but there's a, have you ever seen a, you know, a bird with its claw on its head going, oh no, what's going to happen to dear? <laughs> no, of course we haven't. And of course we remember the words of Jesus who said, you know, do the birds worry? No, the birds don't worry. But their father provides what's needed for them. But listen, a lot of people misunderstand that. And they go, Father, provide what's needed for me. We've heard the phrase, the early bird catches the worm, haven't we? Mm -hmm. You know, a bird, a bird just doesn't sit there with its beak open to heaven going, feed me, Father. <laughs> it gets up in the morning. It goes looking for its food. Otherwise, it will die. It will not receive the inheritance or the promise of God. And a lot of Christians think that our promise, our inheritance, is when we get to heaven. It is not. It is before we get to heaven. You have eternal life now. That's what the Bible says. But you know, another thing with the birds is, is quite, you know, <laughs> using that analogy again, when, when the chicks are in the nest... Of course, the chicks are reliant upon their parents to bring them food at that point. They have a dependency. Oh, <laughs> hmm. I'm going to get back in a dodgy church in a minute. They have a dependency upon the parents. You know, and I got a picture of the church today, especially in this country. We're dependent upon the men and women of God, yet we're fully adults. Because we've been brought up in a culture where the guy or the woman at the front does everything for us. And they bring us something on a Sunday and they, they shove it down our beaks. And that sustains us until the next Sunday. And we've got adults living in nests. Wouldn't it be weird? Wouldn't that be weird in the natural if a bird was an adult and still living in the nest? What's the aim of the parent? Now listen, a little bit of seriousness. This is down to leadership. It's down to leadership understanding their role, their biblical role. And, and it's quite simple. It's never changed. It, the Bible is clear what the job of leadership is. It's to equip the saints for works of service. That's the role of leadership. It's not to do everything so that we end up with, with, with adult Christians who, who are still being fed on a weekly basis, by leaders. That's not the role of the church. It's not the role of leaders. And leaders, we need to wake up to this. We need to start empowering people. We need to move away from the fact of, of, of maybe getting some level of security that people need or depend from a leader or depend on a leader. Your identity as a leader is not in you being a leader. It's in, it is in who we are in Christ Jesus, whether you're a leader or not. Uh, you have a function. I have a function. And we have to operate in that function. But our job description is simple. To equip the saints for works of service. For his works of service. Let's hope we never have too many fully fledged Christians still living in the nest <laughs> as adults. Because what that does then is it prevents the adult birds from reproducing again. Because all their energy is spent feeding these. I don't know, that makes sense, but 
it made some sense to me. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Joshua was a leader because he believed that God was a great God. You see, when people seen big giants, in their mind they had a little God. But when Joshua seen big giants, he seen little giants with a big God. God could overcome. The book isn't really about Joshua and his inheritance. It's a much bigger picture than that. But actually it's about the God of Joshua. It's about what God was doing. And it's about what God is doing. But he needs us. Do you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to finish. He needs us. I'll say it again. He needs us. He needs you to put some feet to your faith and to begin to walk the land, claiming your inheritance, but also, also taking the land that he has promised you. Can you imagine being in a rowing boat and only having one oar? I don't know if you've done that. When I was young, I've done that. That's partly because my mate threw the other oar out, but we had one oar. What can you do? You go around in circles. You go round and round in circles. And so it is with many of us when it comes to talking about biblical inheritance. We believe we've got it, but we're going round and round in circles. Why? Because the other oar is your feet. And when you begin to put faith in there and you begin to act out and walk out and move, you begin to take the land your feet steps on Suddenly, that's another oar, and you begin to make progress in a straight line. But you cannot stand, we cannot stand, and go, Jesus has done it all with our beaks wide open and expecting God to fill it. Now, the Bible does say, open your mouth and God will fill it. But after that, after he's done that, you then have to walk the land. You then, through faith, have to walk the land and walk it out. Joshua took many, many people into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He had many battles to win, and he only took a percentage of what was promised him because he only managed to walk on a percentage of the land. I believe if he walked all of that land, he would have took all of that land. Why? Because the promise of God said so. So your inheritance is full. It's there. It's rich. It's a treasure trove of, of goodness from heaven. What I would love to encourage you to do today is open the box, begin to look in, and begin to receive what is already yours by faith, stepping into it, believing what the Bible says about you, disregarding those thoughts that you get that I'm just a grasshopper. In my own mind, I'm just not worthy. You are worthy. Christ's blood has made you worthy and therefore you are fully in. You are in Christ Jesus. God took the children of Israel out that he might bring them in. You're in Christ Jesus. Enjoy your inheritance and enjoy the sunshine of the bank holiday. See you soon.